Okay. Anytime you want. So my name is Willie Manners. My father was Bob Manners, who oh, served. Well I've forgotten about that one. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that that's the last of them. Yes. <laughs> right. Okay. My name is Willie Manners. My father was called Bob Manners, and he served in the Royal Air Force from 1941 to 1946. And he joined up when he was 18 years old, like so many of his generation. And he was sent to Arizona to learn to fly. He told me that they took uh, what was a cruise liner from Liverpool and they were escorted off the coast of Ireland by the Royal Navy. And then they just opened the engines up and they went for New York as fast as they could on the basis that the U-boats couldn't catch them. They were going too fast. And they arrived in New York, and then they took the train to Arizona, which I think took something like three days. And when I asked him why Arizona, he said 365 days a year, perfect flying weather, so they could train pilots quicker and better than in this country. And he went to Falcon Field, arriving in December 1941, shortly after Pearl Harbor, which was course number six, I believe, and learned to fly on a Boeing Stearman. Uh, and I don't know how long the course lasted. It was obviously a seminal experience for him. Uh, and he told me that when they left, they marched through the high street and the town turned out to bid them farewell, which must have been a remarkable experience. What else did he tell me about? He just told me it was very hot. It was semi-desert. Um, he crashed a plane at some stage. They had a low landing competition and he decided to come in under the telephone wires and crash the plane, but I don't know whether that was actually uh, in Arizona. And then he returned to this country where he was a flying instructor for a while, teaching people to fly on tiger moths. He flew Whitley bombers and then he converted to mosquitoes uh, and he was uh, sent out to India, which of course we expected was going to be the next big invasion from uh, Japan. And he flew photographic reconnaissance trips. So the mosquito was unarmed, full of fuel and full of cameras. Uh, and then eventually he was stationed uh, in the Far East uh, flying over Thailand, the Burma Railway, uh, places like that. Uh, and there's a lovely newspaper cutting of him uh, having flown uh, a 2,600 mile flight lasting nine hours on a reconnaissance trip uh, without landing or refueling. Uh, and uh, when he spoke about that, he said, well, I really just drove the taxi. He said, the navigator told us where to go and the engineer kept the engines running, typically modest uh, of that generation. Uh, and his only other comment was that he had a very sore bottom when he got out of the aeroplane. Um, and then he came out, of was demobbed in 1946 and uh, went into civilian life and became a solicitor and spoke not very much of, of his war experiences, but you know, only the funny bits like people being seasick on the way over on the boat to New York and seeing the Statue of Liberty. Uh, what else can I tell you? Well, the guy's getting to just brush back the yep. and, uh, Yeah, perfect. There you go. Did, uh, he, did he ever mention about whether there was a family that he was assigned to, you know, or the way the people were there? No, he remembered people were incredibly hospitable uh, and he remembered steakhouses. Uh, he never mentioned a, a, a family uh, that I recall. Did he ever mention his trips to you? Because obviously he took the trip to the Grand Canyon. Did he ever discuss that with you? No, until you identified the photographs. I just assumed that those were, were parts, of, parts of Arizona being very, being very arid. And, and, and uh, so I didn't even know that was the Grand Canyon, I'm afraid. <laughs> Uh, um, so he, he, so he, and he never, uh, and I didn't see any in there of Hollywood, although w a couple of them could have been, I suppose. Um, and he never mentioned the food other than the steakhouse. No, he just mentioned the steakhouse, but he was very much a meat and two veg man. 
Nothing, nothing too sophisticated. And nothing. Uh, what about the swimming pool? Did he ever mention a swimming pool? No, I'm afraid I don't recall any mention of a swimming pool. Now, his flying, does he, did he mention any particular events that happened while he was flying other than the crash? Uh, yes, you remember being uh, um, uh, uh, taught to, to stall the aeroplane uh, and how to get out of a spin, which was to put the stick forward so the plane went down and faster, not pull the stick back. Um, uh, he certainly did aerobatics, he, he, he would mention those uh, occasionally. He could do a loop-the-loop -loop, uh, and so on, all of which I think he was taught there. Um, I don't recall much else. Any night flying? Yes, uh, yeah, he must have done, that's a good question, he must have done night flying because he said the hardest thing to learn was learning to uh, fly just using your instruments because you had to suspend all your senses. Your senses would tell you that you were going left, but in fact your instruments told you you were going straight on and flying level. Uh, and I think they, they, they learnt to fly on instruments using fogged out goggles. Uh, so they couldn't look forward, they could just see the instruments. And he said that was the single hardest thing to do, was to learn to trust your instruments, because it was counterintuitive. Did he ever make reference about how those days at Falcon Field affected his later life? It left him with an enormous, uh, I think, admiration for the Americans um, uh, and the fact that uh, this aid was provided before Pearl Harbor, so before America came into the war when it was, of course, had been in a very isolationist period. Um, so it left, left him with a, a lasting affection for Americans. He then served with a lot of New Zealanders, uh, who he said were incredibly tough. Um, uh, one of his logbooks actually says Royal Canadian Air Force. I don't know why. <laughs> Maybe they didn't have enough logbooks uh, uh, to go around. It's funny you say that because there have been others that have the same Royal Canadian. It says Royal Canadian, so. Mm. But they started off in Canada. A lot of them went to New York and then ended up in Moncton, Canada, and then went down. So that's what some of them did. So they had they had a brief time there before they they went further down. It's possible he did that, but I I don't know. And then what are the stories that you have around the scarves? The scarves are ex extraordinary. They're beautiful silk scarves, uh, which uh, were really I think escape scarves. So they were maps of where they were flying over in Indochina, as the, as then called. So they wore them around their necks. And so if you, if you wrap, wrap one around your neck, it just looks like a very beautiful scarf. But then when you unwrap it, it's this extraordinary, you know, detailed map of the area over which they were flying. Uh, and then they were also issued with more like a pocket handkerchief, which are all the different Chinese and Malay languages explaining who they were uh, and that they were friends and not the enemy. Uh, fortunately, he was never shot down, so he never had to use them uh, in anger. Would, um, of his whole career in the RAF, was there anything else that he that stood out for him? I, I think the other place was, was living in India for near, the nearly two years of, of the war. He was fascinated by India. They, they traveled all over. Um, he was put in charge of a train at one stage, so he would have been 20 years old while he was put in charge of a train. I have no idea. They were, I think, shifting troops from one place to another. Uh, and he was really fascinated by India. Uh, and uh, he, I remember he used to talk to local people about um, India's desire to be independent. And uh, he shared a compartment uh, with um, a, 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 an Indian once who said to him, we like the English very much, but it's time you go. After the war, you must go. And, and indeed we did. Um, so he was, yeah, I think that was, I think that and learning to fly in America were probably the two most formative experiences of, you know, his youth, because that was, you know, 18 to 23, just gone, largely serving abroad. Um, it's, it's extraordinary, really. And what I think is, what's quite fascinating is there's a photograph of him with my grandfather who was in uniform as well having served in the first world war 
And you can see my grandmother's face saying, here we go again. Son in uniform, husband in uniform. Are we really going through this all over again? Must have been extraordinary, extraordinary for the women knowing what was going to happen. Well, yes, too, because everyone was, that's why often they didn't speak so much about the food because of here the food was rationed so mm. much. So it's interesting that he only ever mentioned the steak. Yes, <laughs> yes. I suppose when he came back here, a steak would have been a rarity. <laughs> now, if you were giving a message to the people of Falconfield on the 80th anniversary, what would your message be? I think it would be a thank you. I mean, a thank you for their hospitality. Uh, 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 thank you for teaching them to fly safely and, and well. And, and he survived the war based on the skills he learned at Falcon Field. Is there anything I'm missing? Yes. I'm just going to quickly have a look at my notes here and see if there's anything I'm missing here. Oh, yes, there is one. Okay. Um, I noticed that in some of the pictures there's a lot of cowboys and horses mm. and rodeos. How did your father feel about that? Well, he loved that because he grew up in the New Forest riding. I think he could ride before he, 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 he walked. He always said if it hadn't been for the war, he would have been a jockey. Uh, not a remark that amused my mother very much. Uh, and I, I do vaguely recall mention of, of that. And he, he was just fascinated by, uh, you know, the cowboys catching the cattle and things like that, which is very similar to what they do on the New Forest with the ponies. So I think in a way he almost felt at home there. Um, I think. Oh yes, is there anybody he kept in touch with uh, that he was with at Falcon Field? He, he, yes, I think he might have been a squadron leader. Whether he met at Falcon Field, I don't know. But I recall as a small boy going to this house in the Isle of Wight to meet somebody who'd been in the RAF with him. Uh, and the top of his house was the most amazing train set. But we weren't allowed to play with it. It was for grown-ups only. And, uh, but whether that was someone my father had served with in Arizona or India or somewhere else, I'm afraid I don't know. Hmm. It's interesting because the one who's 100, he's a squadron leader. But he, he lives in, uh, in uh, the Cotswolds. Yes. So it wouldn't, and I don't think there was a train set around, was there? No, I don't think so. No. Um, I think. What am I missing? Was there any uh, of the memorabilia in there? Is there anything that you can think of that might spark something for you? Um, I'm just trying to think of those other pictures. The Grand Canyon, the horses. Um, uh, oh, did he ever mention about the women in Arizona? Yeah, he said they were very beautiful. <laughs> but I think at age 18, that would have been a very typical comment of, of an 18-year-old. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I can't think of what the me oh yes. If you can discuss the medals that you have. Yes, I mean he. I'd have to get them actually. Oh, okay, you're you, here. I'll go get them for yeah, you. Yeah, to remember what 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 they are. Done pretty well so far. Have you done many interviews? No, no, no. Yeah, it's a. Somewhere. Do you mind hanging on? I've got a bit of pa I've got a bit of paper of what they are. My brother-in-law, who was in in the army, I think worked out what they all were. No, God, I'm going to have to try. I mean, they are. So you've got the victory. You know, I'm not sure I know. So he's got he's got the Burma Star, the Pacific Medal. Um, Don't worry, we'll take a picture of it, so we'll yeah. some, they'll recognise them, I'm sure. Yes, I ought to know. I thought Jeremy yes, had I'm written. Sure I'm sure they'll. they'll I thought Jeremy so we'll, written. We'll a, I mean, they're all. They, I mean, he didn't get a, um, a DFC or anything like that. So, that they're, they're campaign medals. 
So he's got the Burma star. I think you've got, what's that one called? The something else star. Um, I don't know. Don't worry, yeah. it's fine. We'll, go, we'll, we'll take a picture of that one. Yeah. Um, the only other question I can think of is, did he ever mention about his instructor to you, of the, the people that taught him? No, I'm afraid not, oh. no. Okay. No. Um, there was a... <laughs> the only person he mentioned that when they were on the ship coming out, coming across the Atlantic, uh, a lot of them were very seasick, including the sergeant who was a bit of a bully, so they used to offer him bacon, which, of course, if you're feeling seasick, made you feel even worse. <laughs> but, did, and did he ever recount any of the trips on the train? No, he just said it took something like three days. And, and now you come to mention, I think the train might have gone almost up to the Canadian border and down, which may explain the logbook. Um, but that does ring a, a, a faint bell. Yes, because most of them did start off up there and, 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 and go down. Yes. Um, well, then I, expe yes. I, I expected... That would explain. I expect he did that. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, is there anything else you can think of? No, I'm afraid there isn't. Um, no worries. No. Perfect. See, no. well, that was easy and painless, yeah. wasn't yeah. it? Yeah, yeah. It's very painless. Yeah. <laughs> so now 